Hello, welcome back to the next section, creating digital maps. We will begin this section by styling our data. Then we will understand about projections, prepare maps, and finally we will create maps. Now we move on to the first video of this section, styling data. In this video, we will be styling raster and vector data. Let's start with a gentle introduction to the representation model in GIS. Not only do the data models of rasters and vectors differ, but also their representation models. As rendering in every decent GIS software is hardware accelerated, raster data are converted to textures, while vector data are tessellated in the rendering pipeline. Hence, raster values have to be mapped to 8-bit or 24-bit textures, images, while the capabilities of vector visualization depend on the implementation. The minimum capabilities are drawing icons as textures, regular shapes, connected lines, and polygons with user-defined fill and stroke colors. First, let's see our elevation model that we use in second section. As we discussed before, this is the simplest rendering option that QGIS has to offer, a single band gray representation. It simply clamps the raster values to a byte, zero to 255, and renders the result as an 8-bit texture. If we open the layers properties and navigate to the style tab, we can see the few options needed for such a visualization. QGIS needs a band, which is unambiguous as we have only one band, and the contrast enhancement set to the stretch to min max. Let's add some colors to this elevation model and see how we can render it as a 24-bit image. For this, we have to change rendering type to single band pseudo color. This mode has a lot of options compared to the 8-bit mode, as it is more complex. QGIS needs to know how many colors it has to use, how to interpolate between colors, and what are the limits to the color intervals. QGIS offers a variety of predefined color ramps to choose from. As we are styling an elevation model, the BRBG color ramp is the best fit for our data. After choosing a color ramp, we can click on Classify, the QGIS automatically builds intervals for our data. As we can see, the classification results in painting the lowest points with brown and the highest with green. We can easily invert this palette by checking in the invert box. If we click on OK, we can see our colored elevation model. With the classification mode set to continuous, we get equal intervals. The whole data range is partitioned into five equal parts, and the colors are assigned accordingly. This means the distribution of the data are not uniform to the intervals. As my model contains values mostly between 84 and 150, I got a lot of green areas and gradually less brown areas. You can see the distribution of your values in histogram. Let's change that in such a way that every interval contains the same amount of values. We can do this by changing the classification mode to quantile. Then click on new color ramp in the color chooser. From the list, select the CPT city option. From the dialog's left panel, choose the topography category and import the elevation color ramp. Give a name to the new palette. and then classify the data with this palette and the quantile mode and get a much more appealing result. If we apply the changes, we can see the coloring of our model changing in a more uniform way. As QGIS does not give an aesthetic color palette for terrain visualization by default, we can import other palettes installed but not enabled. Let's move on to multiband visualizations. A multiband rendering mode needs to access three bands in the same raster. It does not matter if we have more or less bands, it just needs one band in each of the RGB channels. A very good candidate for multiband visualization is our Landsat data. The easiest way to create a single raster from the bands is by creating a virtual raster. A virtual raster is a file that contains only references to the source rasters, therefore it is small but only a few software can handle it. First, go to Raster, Miscellaneous, 
and select Build Virtual Raster, Catalog. Select every band from the downloaded Landsat imagery as input files. Specify a file name at a location you can easily access later. Add the VRT extension to the end of the file name manually. Now check Separate, as otherwise GDAL would try to merge the input rasters and create a single band output. This way it keeps the input rasters in different bands. Let us run the tool now. After running the tool, our Landsat layer appears on the map canvas. We can barely see any colours in it though, as the first six bands of the Landsat 8 Operation Land Imager have this spectral properties. Therefore, in order to get a coloured image, we have to create a 432 combination. To achieve this, open the properties of our Landsat layer, navigate to Style, and choose Band 4 for red band, Band 3 for green band, and Band 2 for blue band. Now we have a coloured image, although the image is quite pale and bright. The bad news is that we have to calculate the original reflectance or radiance values, possibly with some atmospheric corrections, in order to get satellite imagery with the vivid colours that we are used to. However, we can get drastically better results even with some naive colour enhancement techniques. To understand some of these techniques, let's learn why we got such a dull result. The type of the image is a 16-bit unsigned integer, therefore it has a minimum value of 0 and a maximum value of 216 minus 1 equals 65535. Divisible bands, most likely due to the high reflectance of clouds, have maximum values near the absolute maximum, although the majority of their values range between 0 and 11,000. You can observe these data in the histogram and the metadata tabs of the properties window. In the metadata tab, look for the text box at the bottom. When clamping values to a single byte, QGIS accepts user-defined values for minimum and maximum. If we provide values other than the minimum and maximum of our data, it truncates every value outside of this range to 0 and 255, and stretches only the in-between values. As a result, if we increase the maximum value, the values in between become less dominant as they are stretched on a wider range. You saw that stretching to the whole data range of our Landsat imagery is hardly beneficial as it would produce a very dark image. Therefore, it used a technique called cumulative cut and cut the outer 2% of our data in order to remove distortions caused by outliers. However, this method also discarded some important values in the upper range. This is why we got a dull image. There is another popular stretching method called sigma stretching. It calculates the useful range from the mean and the standard deviation of our data. The standard deviation is the density of our data in a quantified form. The more scattered our values are, the higher the standard deviation becomes and vice versa. We can access this method by clicking on the load min max values menu in the style tab. We have to check the mean plus minus standard deviation option and simply click on load as 2 is usually a good measure for excluding outliers while keeping the important values. Don't bother with the negative numbers appearing in the min field. If we apply our changes we can finally see colours although the image is still quite biased towards the upper range of the clamped values. To compensate we can alter some values in the colour rendering menu of the style tab. It might need a few tries to set the best values for your scene. So let's set brightness set to minus 90, saturation set to 20, and contrast set to 10. Let's increase the brightness a bit more. The resulting image is much more vivid, although it might be biased in one of the bands. My result, for example, has an unnatural reddish glow, which can be compensated by increasing the maximum value of the red band. Don't forget to try out other band combinations. These are called false colour images, which can show properties of the land cover otherwise invisible to our eyes. For example, the 543 combination emphasises vegetation, while the 564 combination emphasises waters. Unlike raster data, which can be styled by their individual raster values, Vector data can be styled statically or by their attributes. 
Basic styling includes a simple style for a layer. For polygons, it is a simple fill with an outline, a simple line for lines, while for points, it is a scale-independent circle with an outline. If we open the properties window of a vector layer and navigate to the style tab, we can see the single symbol method applied to the layer. These are cascading styles starting in a parent class, which is predefined for the geometry type and is unchangeable. These styles are truly cascading, therefore if we change a global attribute, like the colour on any member, the whole structure conforms. A parent class can hold multiple children. By clicking on the first, and by default only, child, we can customise the attributes of the style. If we choose a different styling method, and it is a complex one, it will create its own parents and children, which can be parameterized individually. Let's do this. Here are adding the arrows to three different layers. By doing this, we can create more and more complex styles. Also, we can make an unaesthetic yet interesting visualization, as you can see. These simple styles are often used to show the existence of a feature or several features. The other common styling method is thematic mapping. With thematic styles, we can represent attributes visually. There are two distinct types of thematic styles, categorized and graduated symbols. We will be mapping with categories. Categorized symbology is useful for visualizing distinct categories on nominal and ordinal scales. This method isn't type specific, thus we can use it with strings, numbers and any other type of attribute. For example, we can show different countries or hotels with different ratings with different colors. Let's try this out. Let's open the style tab of our administrative layers properties window as usual. Choose categorize styling. Then choose the name underscore one column, as it contains the names of our administrative boundaries. Click on classify to automatically assign random colors to distinct values. Remove the last no data entry with the minus button, as we do not have null values. When this is applied, we can not only see our boundaries colored with distinct colors, but also a legend associated with it in the layers panel. This is useful, as we can put these legends on our digital maps. QGIS's random colour generator is not a naive one. It generates appealing pastel colours to create nice representational models. However, if it is not good enough for you, you can pick great colour palettes for thematic mapping from the Colour Brewer application. You can reach it at colorbrewer2.org. The other common method, graduated styling, is useful to show comparable attributes effectively on interval and ratio scales. This method is type specific, as we can only compare numbers directly. By using this method, QGIS creates intervals, groups the attributes, link a color to every interval and draws the features accordingly. We can apply graduated symbology to every geometry type, although the most common use cases are using a color ramp for shading polygons and applying different icon sizes on points. First, let's apply a filter on our Geo Names layer or its extract to only show some of the settlements. With this query, we can filter only the seats of the administrative divisions. There is another very common type of vector symbology called dot density. It is created by scattering points in the polygons according to a numeric column and a ratio value. This is currently unavailable as a symbology type in QGIS, but it can be achieved with the random points inside polygons variable tool found in QGIS GeoRhythms vector creation tools. Now we will apply a graduated symbology. One, open the style tab of our administrative boundaries layer. Select the graduated symbology. Select a numeric column. Population density is a nice column to work with. Select a color ramp. Here, we have used YL0RBR. Select one of the familiar modes from styling rasters. Quantile works really well with population density. Click on classify and apply the style. Now, open the style tab of our geo names layer 
and select the graduated symbology and the population column. For the symbology method, select size, select a mode and click on classify. With population, equal interval is a good choice for creating initial intervals and modifying them to some more appealing ranges. Let's change the symbol size and then click on classify. The custom ranges should always depend on the properties of the mapped data. For mapping settlements in Hungary excluding the capital city, we used intervals as per the previous result. That's all. Here we styled our data.